Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to be taking a look at all the unique and semi-unique characters in the 8 Princes DLC. Previously, we have excluded these 8 Princes from our character class tier list, simply because these characters do not coexist with the Three Kingdom timeline, so comparing them is a bit pointless. Instead, today we'll be taking a look at each of these 8 princes along with any semi-unique characters that start off within each of their courts before coming back here to rank these 8 princes in our tier list. So kicking things off alphabetically, we have Sima Ai, the Prince of Changsha. Alrighty, so unlike most of our other class tier lists so far, we'll be doing these in-game. The reason being, we're covering a few non-unique generals, therefore artwork-wise, it just doesn't make sense to showcase them outside of the game as a character like Huang Fusheng wouldn't really be identifiable uh, if I don't have them in-game with all their info together. So kicking things off with Sima Ai, the Prince of Changsha, his background information is the Principal Administrator. Now, before we jump into it, I do have to make note that all the characters here will have various amount of stats that doesn't link up very well with the base game and other chapter packs because the Eight Princes is sort of a standalone experience, so all these stats will look a bit inflated for those characters uh, compared to the base game characters, as usually those characters have 60 points of extra stat, sometime you'll see 80 points. Here we can see that Samai has 100 points of stats, 20 points in expertise, 50 points in resolve, and 30 points in instinct. Now this is going to be a common trend uh, for the rest of this video among all 8 princes, as well as some of the semi-unique characters as well. So don't be alarmed, uh, this will be a relative strength between uh, all the princes, so it's not really going to affect our tier list ranking. And in regards to his other faction-wide bonuses, he will give all his units 25% extra ammo. This is fairly strong and really what carries Sima Ai as a character. Now, obviously, this synchronized very well with his faction unique unit, similar to the plus four morale when defending faction-wide, but we're not really here to rank factions. So we're not going to talk about unit, we're not going to talk about synergies between uh, the units or the mechanics of the faction and their ability. We're simply looking at each character, and we're only ranking the eight princes themselves and none of the semi-unique. The main point of highlighting these semi-unique characters is just to take a look at some of the strong characters that start off with each of these princes and talk about their historical importance a little bit just to give a little more color to this DLC since uh, many people kind of see this DLC as full of generics which is very true as there's only the eight princes as unique artworks. So this is Sima Ai's background. Aside from this, age is also a very important factor in this tier list because now everyone's restricted to the same starting date of 291 so it's kind of fair to actually compare everyone's age and availability because for them, they're all the same. They're all faction leaders, they're all available in this timeline, and you could capture every single one of them if you're patient enough for a confederation or abdication uh, in the end game. So Smai being 19, I think historically is a little bit incorrect. He should be a tad older, uh, not much older. I think in the 20s would be much more reasonable. And the reason why they did this is because his birth was not really recorded. All we know is that he's the sixth son of the previous emperor Sima Yan, and we can kind of judge his age uh, with the other sons here or the other princes. Now, not all the princes from eight princes are the son of the previous emperor. Some of them are brothers of the previous emperor or even uncles. They span quite a few generations of the Sima clan, but they're all related to the imperial family. Therefore, they're all princes because each of them have a prince dome. So looking at his item, uh, we have a bronze spear, nothing much going on here, armor, 55, very basic. I think we can call it above average because uh, there's some eight prince member who will wear robes. Uh, some will have slightly better armor, some will have slightly worse, but the stat is exactly on point. 25 points total. That is usually the amount you will see here in eight princes. Three points in expertise, 22 in resolve, minus 15% revenue upkeep. That one I'm not so big on, and then 5% melee attack rate. Overall, pretty decent armor, uh, no complaints here. A lot of his stats are geared towards resolve since he is a champion, which makes him a bit weak as a faction leader since he doesn't have a lot of authority. You only get one extra point of satisfaction from this level of authority that he starts out on. 
Although he has Perceptive, which is great for capturing, he also has Honorable. So these two actually cancel each other out, and there is no faction-wide bonuses on any of his starting trait, which is also a bit weak. So the last thing we have to look at is his starting skills. Usually we look at the three active skills. Now that is going to be less important in the Eight Princes, because Eight Princes used a lot of the existing generic skills for the active ability for all their characters. The reason behind this uh, is twofold. One is less work for the developers, and the second reason is I believe when the development of the Eight Princes happened, it was still kind of geared towards a balanced approach of records mode and romance mode. So they kept a lot of these simple uh, passive buffs and uh, generic ability that was kind of designed for that, whereas later DLCs, uh, the developers kind of abandoned uh, records modes entirely, so we started getting more outlandish and more powerful abilities for these new characters that we now see added into the game. Uh, for Eight Princes, that is not the case. And also note that for the Eight Princes themselves, the skill tree is quite different from the regular game, as they have different lines connecting the skills. If you look at any other character, this is the generic uh, skill tree. It's connected differently. And also the generic skill tree is kind of pre-templated with the necessary basic skills, the non-active ones, that kind of slots in for each class, this is no longer the case for the eight princes themselves. Depending on which active ability they got, so for example here he got a commander skill in the Unyielding Earth, the connecting skills will be commander skills, whereas in the center we have a resolve or a champion skill. So we have a bunch of green abilities around that, and here we have a strategist or a water uh, cunning element uh, skills. So we get a bit of blue uh, skill attached to that. So there's going to be a couple differences, and it's going to be hard to tell if these are good or not. And we have to consider the fact that these are all faction leaders, so we would like to see more faction-wide boost on them. Uh, traditionally, for champions, they would have reach. Here we do not have reach because we don't have any red skills. Instead, we kept flexibility, so that's good for redeployment. We have uh, extra trade route from Judgment. We actually get four food from Abundance, which is changed from the base game, as that's five food for Administrator uh, Commandery. Here we have four food for Advisor, Heir, or Prime Minister, or uh, Faction Leader. Prime Minister is replaced by the Advisor role in Eight Princes. And on top of that, you can note that this skill tree also contains Meditation, which gives us Unbreakable, and also two Yellow Turban abilities, one giving us extra range damage, which plays very well into the range focus of Samai's faction, and 3% industry income faction-wide, which is always nice to have. And you also get 10% research rate from Insight, and research rate is definitely useful in Eight Princes, as the reform tree is a bit different. You actually have to research each individual reform. So that's going to be Sma'ai's abilities here. And then looking at semi-unique characters that starts out in his faction, we have Huang Fu Shang, who has the unique background of Facilitator. Now, these background choices in terms of how they're named are not very historically accurate. So I will talk about what's significant about each of these characters, and sometimes that's not really going to link up with what their background title is, so just be mindful there. But you see here, even a semi-unique character in Eight Princes will have 80 points of stats. 40 Expertise, 20 Resolve, 20 Cunning. His Red News will have Guerrilla Deployment, 20% Recruitment Discount for Melee Infantry and Spear Infantry, so pretty much all infantry units except for Range Infantry will get 20% discount if he is your advisor basically from the beginning, as the advisor role is open to you at all ranks, unlike in the base game where you have to wait quite a bit until you get a Prime Minister. You also get 10% armor for all spear units uh, faction-wide, that's also quite useful. Now, skill tree is very generic. All the characters, aside from the Eight Princes, have the generic skill tree in this game for Eight Princes DLC, so there's really nothing to talk about. They have the exact same tree as a generic Sentinel, which, you know, technically is quite good. His traits are not so bad either. Energetic is good for some campaign movement for his army, and if we do make him a visor, you would get 10% extra trade influence. Uh, nothing going on really with Loyal aside for some satisfaction gain. Starts with a silver armor, but no set bonuses here or nothing special about this armor in particular. Plenty of characters will start out with gold armor in the game, so this is actually quite lacking. 
Now, we're not here to rank these guys. I just want to talk about them historically a little bit. And Huang Fushang here is actually quite an interesting character to place into Sima Ai's court, as he really doesn't have that much to do with Sima Ai early on. He worked under Sima Jun, and when Sima Jun took over alongside Sima Ai for a period, um, he was just the officer there, and Sima Jun eventually got killed by Sima Ai, and then he naturally transferred to working for Sima Ai, and Sima Ai was almost immediately put under siege by Sima Yong, and Huang Fushang was sent out to defend a pass against Sima Yong's general Zhang Feng, a battle which he lost, and then in the future, Sima Ai is going to send him out uh, as sort of a last hope uh, to have him go reach his brother. Huang Fushang has a brother who was I believe in the Qin province, uh, this is in the northwest, he was seeking aid, but along the way he got sold by his nephew who had a grudge against him, and Sima Yun was able to capture him, and he was executed. So not a super significant character historically, and his last name, uh, Huang Fu, suggests that he's related to Huang Fu Song, but historically speaking he is not. I believe the clan might be related somehow because his brother and him are both associated with the Northwest, and Huang Fusong's clan comes from Shuofang, which is also in Northwest. So it could be a distant relative, but it was definitely not recorded that he's somewhat related to Huang Fusong at all. I mean, if he was, that would definitely have made uh, a mark in history. So I'm guessing he's not directly related, but maybe an offshoot of the clan. So that's it for Sima Ai's faction, and moving on, we're going to be talking about Sima Jiong. Alrighty, so we moved on to Sima Jiong, the imperious regent. So Sima Jiong as a character, uh, in terms of how he's related to the throne, is he's Sima Yan's nephew. He is the emperor's cousin. And his backstory is actually quite interesting. We're not going to get too deep into it. If you're interested in the whole affair, definitely check out our Let's Talk Lore series. Uh, but his main role during this period is he worked with Sima Lun to actually get rid of Empress Jia, who is the wife and the controlling party of the emperor who was mentally challenged. Uh, actually, you know, mentally challenged. Didn't develop fully into a tall intelligence, but was made into an emperor regardless, uh, due to a lot of influence from his actual birth mother, the Empress Dowager. Uh, regardless of that, he made the move alongside Sima Lun to get rid of the Empress, and he had a disagreement after that, they had a falling out. There was a advisor in the court named Li Han, who we're gonna see later on in this video, who worked for Sima Yun. And that situation, uh, where he eventually killed Li Han, got him into a fight with Sima Ai. And Sima Ai eventually killed him, took control of the emperor, uh, but before that, he was the dominant regent at court. So. Because of that regency, he got this background title, granting him another 100 points of bonus stat, and because he's a commander, most of that stat went to authority here, 50 points, which is going to make him look pretty good as a leader. Uh, 161 points of authority, 3 yellow traits, even though these traits I would argue are not good. Arrogant, greedy are terrible traits. Charismatic is good, another 5 points of satisfaction, bringing our total to um, 15 points, but we're going to need that 15 points because once we look at his uh, semi-unique character, you're going to understand why. Aside from that, he's 27. Uh, that's a young age. Anything below 60 or not close to 60 is young because that's when you start taking death in the game. And beyond that, faction-wide bonuses is simply 4 morale when attacking, which is quite weak. He gives his own retinue terror, which is a great finisher for routing enemy units as once they are um, kind of shaky or wavering in combat, they will take farther morale damage when next to units with terror, so you can kind of push them over, get them to shatter and rout, uh, but it is almost like a win more type ability, once you're winning it activates, but still very good to give out. Weapon wise, we start out with a silver pair of dual axe, not bad. Armor, 25 points, mainly put into authority, that's the trend with him, 55, slightly above average, 50. 5% uh, melee attack rate, 12% speed, nothing really to mail home about. In terms of abilities, it gets a little bit better. Roar of the Beast, especially after the final patches, morale is very strong in terms of demoralizing enemies, so this is very good. And we have Stone Bark, which is okay. Uh, Unbreakable is nice, getting some of these uh, yellow skills, including Nobility, which give us plus one assignment, is good for the faction. But if you pay close attention to the skill tree, aside from this, there's only Dignity, which gives 5 points of 
faction support and there is not anything else that really helps the faction as a whole uh, no flexibility no reach uh, basically it's quite lacking there's no understanding for one extra startup rank so despite having really high authority that's really all he have because the background bonuses for faction wide is actually quite weak with Samajun as well, and the only trait he has that synergizes well with faction wide is charismatic, which is another five point of satisfaction. So there's not too much going on with him here. And looking at his semi unique character, he has Wang Bao, who is the steadfast preacher. Once again, a title that's completely lost on me in terms of why he has it uh, for what he did historically. Now, the bonus on this is quite nice. He gets 70 points, mostly in resolve because he's a champion, but pay attention here. 20 points of satisfaction penalty for all characters faction wide so this is why we need Simazion to give us 15 points because he has a character that most likely you'll make into a visor because he doesn't have anyone better and the other bonuses here are decent 5% retinue upkeep discount and plus 2 starting rank for all recruit and 3 morale for attacking for his own retinue so you're basically paying a huge cost to satisfaction uh, to get these bonuses and skill tree as we mentioned is the generic one but what he really stands out here is he has perceptive as a trait, add-on patience, he makes for a really good capture general, and the armor. This gold armor, nature's shield, grants his own retinue, fatigue immunity, and gives himself 80 points of armor, which is the highest in the game. So this is definitely uh, god tier armor, uh, but we're not really ranking him, but it's nice to know that he starts out with this, which means no one else can get it, since this is a unique gold item. So. Uh, Wang Bao, what did he do historically uh, to deserve this steadfast preacher? No idea why he got the title because he was just the core advisor when Sima Jiong was in power as a regent and at this time uh, there were many other princes who were very powerful and one of the most popular ones was Sima Ying uh, who we'll see very soon and Wang Bao made this suggestion to the court that he, the country should be split east-west with the west given over to Sima Ying and the east given over to Sima Jiong. And Sima Ai came out. Uh, Sima Ai is not very important during this period. Uh, everyone didn't think Sima Ai was going to be a power because he had a very small force, but eventually he was able to kill Sima Jiong in a miracle defense inside the capital and then take over and then hold the capital for a very long time, elevating him into one of these eight princes' positions. But Sima Ai at the time came out and said that what Wang Bao is suggesting is trying to tear up the unity among these princes and it's against the empire to try to split it up so he suggested to Sima Jiong to kill Wang Bao for suggesting such a thing and Wang Bao was killed so that was kind of his uh, story in this period there's not too much to uh, place him in such import uh, and then to give him something like steadfast preacher also doesn't make a lot of sense but the bonuses are nice and there's an interesting trade-off here which is always nice to see because you don't want to give people just strong strong bonuses without anything to hold them back all right moving on we have Sima Liang Alrighty, on to our third prince uh, Ru Nan Wang Sima Liang the rightful regent. So here we have another regent, and you might be confused, we just had another regent. And the reason why is there is two distinct periods for the Eight Princes conflict. Now the whole period is called Eight Princes, but there's really two periods of action, divided by eight years of Empress Jia's rule. So Sima Liang's story would be in the first arc, as you can see, he's quite old. He's 62 years old, and he is old because he is the son of Sima Yi, the third son of Sima Yi. So the Sima clan has a lot of sons. We can talk about that a bit later when we get bigger numbers. But being the third son means his two brothers are Sima Shi and Sima Zhou, the more famous uh, Sima sons. And obviously Sima Zhao's son will be Sima Yan, who becomes the first emperor of the Jin Dynasty. And he has died, now passing the empire down to this mentally challenged son. So the new emperor would call him uh, Imperial Grand Uncle. So he is very highly ranked in the clan. That's why in the early periods, he was made into a regent. So he would be considered someone who is associated with the imperial bloodline, who is respected, who can help guide his uh, grandnephew uh, as he becomes an emperor. And he didn't have the regency to himself. There was another official uh, named 
Wei Guan, who was also regent, and both of them worked together quite nicely, and because they were friendly to each other, they sort of had power for a little bit, especially when the Empress Dowager died. Uh, but unfortunately, there was someone else who wanted to hold power, and that's Empress Jia. And Empress Jia will eventually get rid of him. So he's gonna die fairly soon, uh, because one of the other princes would actually kill him, kicking off this Eight Princess Saga. We'll get to him uh, once we do uh, a couple more princes. So first off, Rightful Regent gives us 100 points, like all other ones, 50 points in his main class stat, and 30 points of authority because he's a faction leader, so that's decent. He's not over 100 points, but it's still a decent amount at 82. He has a couple of traits to help him out in that regard. And in terms of faction-wide bonuses, 50% income from family estate. So this rich background is kind of given randomly to these factions uh, to balance out their starting gold. So it's used more of a game mechanic from a design balance perspective rather than the fact that they have a rich parent because honestly, all these Smock Clans members have rich parents, so they could all start out with extra 50% income from Family State, which is worth a thousand a turn. Minus one mustering turn, this has to do with his unique unit being what originally inspired the Imperial units, so they have the replenishment penalty, so having mustering turn definitely helps there. Minus 10% revenue upkeep because his unit is extremely expensive, so they're nice bonuses, but regardless, he's gonna die soon. 62 is going to hold back his rank because you start out way too old. Now, on top of that, honorable means you have a hard time capturing generals, but thankfully you have patience at the start. So it's going to balance out to about 15 points extra. That's definitely helpful. Uh, bronze spear is not so good. Armor, very average. 10-15 uh, split in the main stat. 30% range block chance, minus 15% revenue upkeep, 55 armor base. Nothing special going on here. Ability-wise, we do have Stone Bark, which is average. We have Binding Fury, damage ability for dueling, and we have Tenacity of Steel, also good for dueling. So he's a good, decent duelist. Faction-wide, he does have flexibility, which will help. He does have understanding. Abundance will also help a little bit, but nothing else. So I would say that's pretty much average. Uh, no reach as well. So champions, eight princes champion, the eight princes champion not the champion class inside eight princes but champion class princes in this weird tree do not have reach which is a bit unfortunate all right moving on to who else is semi-unique in this faction it would be his two sons which i have some historical gripe about because his oldest son sima Tsui, is already dead by 291 he should not be alive he died young so all the titles actually went to the second son, which the game correctly made heir. But why is the older brother still alive and kicking here and with some interesting background? So Jade Carver is interesting in two regards. One, the bonuses are pretty decent and also synergize quite well with the clan and the faction. But the problem here is Jade Carver is also the name of a generic yellow turban background. So it's a little bit confusing. Uh, we see here you get 10% melee attack rate for the whole faction. Most importantly, 50% diplomatic income from tributary, so this is the same ability that Liu Bao and uh, Zheng Jiang gets. It's very good for Vassal, which is very important for Sima Liang because the faction plays almost exactly like Liu Bao's faction. It's what inspired Liu Bao's faction. And the minus 15 points of diplomatic attitude with most factions, that one is going to be tricky to balance out because you're trying to make Vassals at the same time. So there is a trade-off here, which I actually kind of like. He also started out with the gold armor. Uh, it's the words of the masters, nothing too special here except for Charge Reflect, which I rate pretty highly because it's for any unit in his retinue. They don't have to be spear units anymore. You can get Charge Reflect. And on top of that, you can get Charge Negation also on your own retinues. So imagine if you have a retinue full of Archer units. They can now bounce back enemy cavalry charges and also take no damage from the charge and they can be your front line while shooting arrows at the enemy. Pretty good. I think that's very synergetic uh, for him. So while he should be dead historically, I'm glad he's here with these abilities. Now his younger brother, the second son, uh, Sima Ju, here is the outside heir. He has the 25% general roar increase. That's a remnant of record mode. We don't see that anymore on any of the new characters, so that's another proof that they still had record mode in mind when they made eight princes. You get 10% income from peasantry and 5% replenishment. 
all decent boost here. Uh, most likely he will become your leader soon and then your younger brother will become or your older brother actually uh, would become your heir in that case. Uh, the tree here would be the standard tree which is actually a good thing because you actually get the four skills that you want. Uh, his traits, nothing too special about them. He does start out with a gold armor, scan of the peach tree, which gives his own retinues immune to fear and terror. Not so good, but not so bad. Uh, pretty average armor here. And uh, in terms of historical contribution of them, we mentioned how uh, Sima Liang was the regent, and eventually another prince would be tricked into killing him to give the power to Empress Jia. And on that night, when he got assassinated essentially, Sima Ji was also killed. So this son, the heir, died alongside the father. The other son, the oldest one, should be dead already. And that's pretty much this group as we can move on to Sima Lun. Alrighty, so we have probably the most interesting prince out of the eight princes in Sima Lun, the usurper prince. So he's the only one of the eight princes to actually usurp the throne. He named himself emperor shortly after forcing uh, the mentally challenged emperor to abdicate for a period, but he was killed very soon after because like Yuan Shu who declared himself emperor, all the other factions would all of a sudden unite against you, and that's exactly what happened against him. He had a bunch of bad advice from one of his advisors who we'll soon cover, but his story is also very interesting. So he is the ninth son of Sima Yi, so Sima Liang would be his older brother third son, he's the ninth, and his mother is Lady Bo. Uh, for those of you who have watched Advisor Alliance, which is a TV drama covering Sima Yi's life, uh, that's his mom. And in the drama, they take a lot of creative liberties and states that Sima Yi was faithful to his one wife, Zhang Chunhua, and was forced to take uh, Lady Bo as a concubine because Cao Pi wanted to spy on him, so forced this girl onto him to spy on him. Uh, but that's not the case historically. Sima Yi had many concubines, and that's why he had nine sons. And Sima Lun's mom, uh, Lady Bo, was one of the concubines he really favored later on in life. That part is true, uh, which make him a very spoiled uh, young son. And that's going to show as he's going to dare to usurp the throne himself. And if we look at his stats, the Usurper Prince, we have a lot of stats. That's his calling card. He's quite weird as a prince. He has 20 points of expertise, 65 points of cunning. The only prince who does not have the dominant stat as his main uh, stat boost. So as a commander, 65 points of cunning. He still has 50 points of authority, but if you sum it all up, it's 135 points of stat. It's massive. And we're not going to talk about subterfuge, that's his faction mechanic. Uh, enable stock for his own retinue, which is quite interesting because he gives his basically invisible units. And then you have enable guerrilla deployment for his own army, so you can hide the army too. His faction wide bonus is minus 10 diplomatic attitude with most factions, as we mentioned. If you usurp, everyone else will hate you. And if we look at his armor and weapon, nothing too fancy about the weapon, but the armor, more stats. 30 more points of cunning, as though the 65 was not enough, and then 8 points of instinct and 17 points of authority. So instead of 25 points, we get 55 points from armor, but it's a robe, so only 25 armor base and 12% speed. Still, very interesting character design here. And he also starts out with 4 traits. So we have Deceitful, a spying one, a defiant, not much for the faction, superstitious, which is more historical, and then uh, suspicious, which is good for countering enemy spies. And the skill tree is also interesting. So everyone had like a generic skill, but he has surprise attack. And this gives him um, extra speed, extra damage for units around him in 75 meter range for 60 seconds, gives them cause fear, and also give them stock. So potentially he can give his whole army stock for 60 seconds for a surprise attack. So that's pretty interesting. And in terms of his tree, um, there is the typical nobility for faction wide boost, a trade route here, and then there is also this experience boost, but nothing else really. Uh, adamant resolve, inspiring surge, just really nothing to mail home about. So not that strong in terms of faction wide bonus. You can see the only thing he's bringing to the faction is minus 10 diplomatic points. So it's just a very interesting design overall. Seems to be more combat focused. Uh, this, combined with the fact that he gives his own retinue stock anyways, can create some interesting strategies, although there's really no good unit to utilize that, because if you're thinking about invisible 
units, you really want cavalry. Uh, he does have a unique cavalry. Uh, it's a nice shot cavalry with shield, but maybe you would want it with range, right? You might want horse archers on him, even though there's no snipe, you can kite and then become invisible. You have the speed boost, you have armor piercing damage boost, you have fire arrows, you have range damage boost. It seems like, you know, having range cavalry should be his thing. So, you know, with high cunning as well. So a lot of good things about him, uh, but very strange. And then we're going to talk about his semi-unique general, Sun Xiu. Now, I personally think Sun Xiu is probably the worst person in this historical period. And I'll, I'll explain why. And he's definitely full of bad advice. He was a visor uh, to Sima Lun. He was instrumental in convincing Sima Lun to kill Empress Jia and abdicating the emperor and ascend the throne himself. And when all the other princes teamed up to fight Sima Lun, he was performing rituals because he was a follower of the Five Pecks of Rice, which is this Taoist sect that was started or continued by Zhang Lu out west. But remember when Zhang Lu surrendered to Cao Cao, he was moved to Ye in the north and he brought along a lot of his followers with him and the five peck of rice sect actually grew uh, during the Jin dynasty and he was one of the followers it's a Taoist sect you can think of them as neo yellow turbans with different ideals but following Taoism not the same and he performed all these rituals claiming that heavenly troop will come aid them and there were all these signs pointing to Sima Lun should become an emperor and pretty much sold him on the whole idea and he abused his power after Sima Lun ascended to the throne he caused the death of many famous people during this period uh, the wealthiest man in China was killed by him because he wanted one of his concubine and when he you know presented the concubine to him the concubine didn't want to go with him because Sun Xiu was uh, kind of described as kind of ugly and short, uh, so she chose suicide, which made him angry, and then he had the wealthiest man executed for that. And then the other guy he killed is known as the most handsome man in Chinese history, Pan An. So we all know there are four beauties in Chinese history, which includes Diao Chan. Uh, well, there's also the four handsome men in Chinese history, which includes the number one spot, who is Pan An. And Pan An lived during the Jin Dynasty in this period and was a well-known uh, kind of a calligrapher and Xuan Xue, which is, I want to say philosopher, but really they're just like, they're like druggy mythics. Uh, doing drugs was very popular in the Jin Dynasty. And then they talked about philosophy, which is kind of a, I don't know. It's not really deep philosophy. Xuan Xue is kind of like, uh, stuff you would say after you get high and uh, there is some philosophy attached to it but it's not a real thing uh, but regardless uh, Pan An was deemed the most handsome man and he got executed by uh, Sun Xiu as well when the two of them got into a disagreement over something so he did plenty of bad things and eventually um, some of the princes when they had them under siege will cause many of the guards inside the capital city to turn on them and he got turned on and got killed inside the palace so he died uh, alongside uh, Sima Lun. so as a character though he is quite strong he has the partisan which probably represent him forming parties within the court it gives him 80 points of stat nothing fancy there Fatigue resistance for own retinue, 10% discount for all cavalry units, which syn synergizes quite well with the faction, and then 5% armor, 2 morale, silver armor doesn't really stand out, but burn trait, the best thing in the game. Charismatic, also pretty good for 5 point satisfaction, and like his boss, superstitious. They're kind of exploiting each other uh, there. And there's also hints that he was someone who is a nan chong for Sima Lun. Now, both of them had wives, but um, biracial activity, or you can think of plutonic activity, or like ancient Greek had this as well. So there was rumored um, sexual tension between the two of them as well. Uh, that's why they trusted each other. Um, but that's not something we have to delve too deep on. Uh, if you want to hear the story, like always, refer to the Let's Talk Lore series. That's much more in depth. And that's the only character that's semi-unique in this faction. So we can move on to Sima Wei. Alrighty, so we have Sima Wei, the tempestuous general, who is 33. So he's made a little bit older, and Sima Ai was made a little bit too young, 
because Sima Wei is the fifth son of Sima Yan, and Sima Ai is the sixth son. So they're one apart, but their age is somehow 14 year gap, which does not make any sense. And he is involved in the first phase of the eight princes. He is the prince that will kill Sima Liao. So at this time, he was a pretty eager prince who wanted to prove himself. And he had a sizable military force under him in the capital, and he got used by Empress Jia to remove the regents. So the story behind him is that he was given a chance to prove himself by the emperor, his brother, and the empress, who claimed that the two regents, Sima Liang and Wei Guan, were trying to usurp the throne and control the courts. So the emperor gave him a secret message saying, go kill these regents for us. And he did that. And once he did that, the next day, Empress Jia came out and said, we never gave him this command. He's hungry for power and he killed the regents to take control himself. Now arrest him. And he got arrested and killed. So he was kind of used as a weapon by the empress who wanted to control his, her you know, mentally challenged husband and the court. And she did for the next eight years. And so basically you had Sima Wei and Sima Liang in a political intrigue that marked the first part of the eight princes and then Empress Jia gained control for the next eight years, nothing happened. And then the following princes kind of took power by overthrowing Empress Jia and then fought among each other for a period until finally Sima Yue came out the winner. So it was a very long stretched out event that lasted a total of 16 years with most of the action happening near the end. But to kick things off, we have Sima Wei and Sima Liang fighting each other. So as a character in the game, he is made very strong and very focused on battling. We're looking at 100 points of stats, nothing strange here, but look at the bonuses. 10% melee damage for every unit type, 15% campaign movement range, 10% replenishment. You can't ask for better bonuses for combat than these. These are very, very nice. He starts out with a silver axe, he starts out with an armor uh, that's a little bit lower in terms of armor value, uh, but overall not bad. His traits, nothing fancy here, uh, you can say they're borderline bad. But his skills, we have Biting Fury, Damage Ability, Flame of Phoenix, Damage Ability, and then Nature's Ally, which is uh, pretty good for Cavalry and Speed Boost, Morale Boost, Ignore Forest Penalties, nothing bad there. And then looking at the skill tree here, finally we have someone with Reach, we have someone with Flexibility. He even have Nobility for extra assignments. So actually, despite the fact that he is a Vanguard, he actually probably have the most complete skill tree for a faction leader. And his authority stat is not that low. And we also have access to meditation to make him unbreakable. So there's a lot of great things going on for Sima Wei here. Now in terms of his semi-unique generals, we have two actually. And both of them are not that important because as we heard the story, he shined brightly and then flickered out in one night. And the two generals are Gong Sun Hong, uh, who's not related to Gong Sun Zan at all. And then we also have Qi Sheng. So Gong Sun Hong and Qi Sheng are both officers in his army. Um, observant advisor didn't do too much historically, so I don't know why he got the title. We got 70 points of stats, another 5% campaign movement range, 5 per, uh, points of melee evasion for all melee infantry, some undercover network cost increase for enemy spies, morale for his own army, pretty good. Main thing, but in general, nothing to say here. Then we have Qi Sheng, who actually did something that night. So after he killed Sima Liang, Qi Sheng actually gave him a really good advice. Qi Sheng said, we should take the men and go kill Empress Jia and take control. And Sima Liang basically had no big ambitions for himself. He just wanted to prove himself and get rewarded for it. He trusted the emperor and the empress and he got played. But his advice, despite being a bit power hungry, was the correct call. Uh, but obviously Sima Wei didn't listen to him and uh, they all ended up getting killed. So that's it for them. As for the character in game, his bonuses are more focused on himself. You can see the 10% campaign movement range and 10% melee attack rate are for his own army. Uh, if you don't see any words behind it, it's definitely not faction wide and you can check here under either personal for any sort of bonuses or under army for any sort of bonuses. So in this case, it's under personal. So it means that he has to kind of lead the army um, to get that bonus. It doesn't say, uh, oh wow. 
But what about the attack rate? Oh, correct me. This is even better, because you don't actually need to make him into a position. There's no conditional statement, but you're getting that bonus regardless. Where is his 10% melee attack rate? I don't see it under army. Is it hidden here, where I just can't see it? It's... Ah, it's personal boost. He got a minus 3 on the armor, plus 10 on the self. So that's correctly given to self, but somehow the 10% movement is given to the faction with no conditions, which means it's automatically given to every army in the faction, regardless he's a leader or not. So that means we get 10% here, 5% here if he is a visor, which I think you should make him a visor, and then you get another 15% here. So we're looking at 30% campaign movement boost for the faction. Uh, I mean, it's a strong faction, but we're not ranking factions here. We're still just going to focus on the character as a whole. But basically, that's what he started out with, and a silver armor. Um, pretty interesting characters. Uh, not so significant historically, just because their boss died too early. And moving on, we're going to be looking at Sima Yi. Alrighty, and we're on to Chengdu Wang, Sima Yi, who is also 19. And we have a problem here with age once again. He should be younger, because he was the 16th son of Sima Yan. Um, so the Emperor will be his older brother, Sima Wei will be his older brother, Sima Ai will be his older brother. He's quite young at the start. But he is definitely beloved, just like his title suggests, beloved governor. There's high hope for him. He was a handsome kid. Uh, people thought he was very bright. And the game has him a little bit dumb. The game is saying that he is a little mentally challenged too. Uh, not to the degree of the Emperor, but a little bit dim-witted. But historically, I don't think there's anything that suggests that. It's just that he got a little bit arrogant once he got some power, and he stopped listening to his advisors, and he has some really good advisors. So that might be a case, but I don't think he was personally stupid or anything. And if we look at his stats, the game, however, makes him a little bit weak. This is the first prince with very low stats, 45 points, which usually seems like a decent number, but it's actually super low, even for the base game, where you know, unique characters with art gets 60 points. Here he only gets 45 points and he has most of it in authority with 20 points in cunning, which is his main class. He does have some nice faction-wide boost, 10 points of satisfaction, 50% income from family state, five noble support, which is the same thing as public order. Uh, noble support is public order in eight princes, 50% income from peasantry, so he's this beloved lord who can tax his citizens, basically. And looking at him, aside from this, he has a gold weapon. The first one we've seen so far. Um, it's a pretty good weapon. Mandate Ward just gives you extra morale. It's not that good. The satisfaction boost makes it better on, say, uh, air or perhaps a visor. And you have an armor that has 25 points of stat. It's a robe, so 20 points here for him. 15% to evade captures, not that useful. 40% ammo for himself is good. Find this man bow, and he will do decent damage. Extra 40% armor does do quite a bit. Now, in terms of his skill tree, we're looking at Temporary Deflection, Wisdom River, which is quite strong, and Earthen Rampart. So pretty passive in all these debuff and buffs, basically. He also has Insight available to him, and a lot of range skills, which are not that good uh, for faction-wide. So there is a trade here. And aside from this trade here, I don't see anything else that's faction-wide. Yeah, nothing else. Capture rates available and research rate, but not much going on in terms of skill tree. He does have charismatic, so there's more satisfaction here. He also starts out with four traits, but nothing too fancy here as well. Uh, in terms of his semi-unique generals, he has three, which represent you know the wealth of advisors and people who helped him. Uh, but his history is also a little bit disappointing. He kind of you know, was pushed into a nice position when he teamed up with Sima Jiong, but afterward, uh, he kind of was turned on to his older brother Sima Ai, and then he was fighting Sima Yun. When he lost that fight, uh, he kind of just used the wrong people because he was trying to gain favor from the clans in the south, uh, which once again, it's a story you can read uh, in the Let's Talk Lore series. The Eight Princes, despite being a bad DLC uh, in terms of delivery and timing, uh, is... Pretty good in terms of source material. This period 
is not that well known, uh, even for uh, Chinese fans, since it's not really a Three Kingdoms story, but it's very riveting and uh, quite interesting as a whole. Now, in terms of semi-unique characters, he has uh, first Shi Chao, who is one of his more trusted generals. That's why he's the Central Army Protector. You get 110 points of stats with him, which is quite impressive. Uh, 50 points of expertise, and more importantly, he has 25% capture chance uh, post-battle on the character. Add on the patience, we're looking at 50%. He's probably the best character to capture people in the game. 5% uh, retinue upkeep is pretty good, 2 morale is okay, uh, 2 morale for retinue when defending is pretty poor. Uh, nothing too special here in traits, uh, but potential to maybe pick up Perceptive, just because Cunning's decently high. He has a gold armor, Spirit of the Dog, uh, nothing too fancy here, but the main point is it's very good as a capture general, and then 5% retinue upkeep is not too shabby either. Uh, historically, he just basically fought in most of Sima Ying's battles, eventually lost to uh, Sima Yong, and I think he got killed uh, in battle against Sima Yue. Um, so he lived quite a long time. He fought in many battles, but eventually died. And then we have uh, two very interesting characters to talk about. So his name is Lu Zhi. Uh, not Lu Zhi, but Lu Zhi, the one from Three Kingdoms, the Man of Heaven faction, is his great-grandfather. They are actually related. And uh, he has a background similar to his great-grandfather, 10% character experience. That's basically what Luger did uh, before he got an update to his background as a faction leader. 80 points of stat, gold armor, pretty good, and burnt. So nothing to really complain here. He was a pretty early on advisor uh, for Sima Ying, who despite being the prince of Chengdu, wasn't actually in Chengdu, he was actually in Ye, so he was in the north, and that's why uh, the Lu clan eventually made his way to his court. But as Sima Ying grew up, he stopped listening to him, uh, which made him get neglected and fired. But after Sima Ying died, uh, Lu Zhi actually offered to host a funeral for him and bury his body, which is, you know, a Confucian sign of loyalty, uh, very true to his clan being the righteous decision makers because when he died, obviously Sima Yue, who caused his death, wasn't a fan of him, you know, but he respected uh, Lu Zhi and let him bury him. Uh, eventually, when the capital of the Jin Dynasty will get overran by Normans, uh, he would get captured and he would eventually die imprisoned by the Normans because after the Eight Princes Saga, the Jin Dynasty was very, very weak and the Normads came down uh, in troves and pretty much wiped out the Jin Dynasty. Then lastly, we have Lu Ji. So both uh, L-U, but pronounced slightly different, different tones on the surname. And he is Lu Xun's grandson. Lu Xun obviously being the grand, uh, or the off, uh, what, I think director of the officers, I think the Da Dudu title uh, for the Kingdom of Wu and uh, the director of the fight against Liu Bei, who won, uh, was quite an important general for the Kingdom of Wu, and he's the grandson. And he is the general in the south that uh, Sima Ying tried to appease alongside the brother, uh, who is right here, uh, Lu Yun, except for he didn't get a semi-unique background, only Lu Ji got it, renowned scholar. Um, interesting stats as well, we're looking at 90 points with a minus 10 instinct. He led the army that assaulted Sima Ai with overwhelming numbers but because all the other generals that worked for Sima Ying didn't like the fact that he got to lead the army because he was seen as an outsider who their leader is trying to appease the southern clans didn't really work with him and Sima Ai was able to exploit this and overcome uh, an army size that he should never have overcome the difference was massive I'm thinking I think at least 40 time difference and because of his defeat there uh, the other officers sort of blamed him for the defeat, and he was eventually framed and was executed. So not a good end for him. And he has 25% ammo for his own retinues, 10% uh, research rate, minus 3 morale, kind of reflecting on the historical balance with his forces, 10% income from all sources. Overall, it's a decent set of bonuses for faction growth. The morale doesn't hit that hard, and the other bonuses are quite useful. Uh, in terms of trait, he did not get burnt, so he's actually a little bit weaker on the list here. So that's going to do it for all the generals for uh, Sima Yun, as we were going to move on to Sima Yun. Alrighty, so we're on to our Pent Ultimate Prince here, Sima Yun, the Shu Defender. 
So he joined in the conflict quite late because he was seen as an outsider. In terms of his relationship to the imperial bloodline, he's the grandson of Sima Fu. Sima Fu is Sima Yi's third brother. Um, he's Sima Yi's the second brother. So the younger brother of Sima Yi. So whereas everyone before him comes from Sima Yi's direct line, he does not. And Sima Fu was actually a little bit against Sima Yi's coup. So his side of the clan is definitely not that featured. But regardless, he was made into a prince with a princedom, He Jianwang, and he was quite capable in terms of battling. He had a very good general under him, but in terms of intrigue and dealing with his officers, he was not very good, and that was eventually his downfall, as he will lose out at the end to Sima Yue. After uh, putting up quite a good defense out west, he will be tricked uh, with an offer to take up position in the court. And on the way to the court, he and his sons were strangled to death by Sima Yue's brother. So as a general, however, uh, in the game, he is very strong. We're looking at the typical 100 points of stat, mainly an instinct, 50% reinforcement range. This is actually quite good. Especially for defensive armies, you can set up traps with ambushes next to towns uh, to get really big defensive or reinforcement range. 50% income from family state, always helpful. 15% campaign movement, always good. And his own army will get 20% speed, which is pretty underrated. I think that's actually quite good. Weapons, gold, eater of courage, very good. And his armor, uh, the same 25 points. Main focus on cunning, which is a little weird. But 75 armor is the highest armor here among the princes, so very good there. In terms of skills, we're looking at Binding Fury, Damage Ability, Roar of the Beast, which I think is probably the strongest ability from all the generic skills. And then he also has Tenacity of Steel on top of that alongside his good weapons, so that is very strong here. And he also can stack on Zeal for more attack rates, and we're looking at uh, Flexibility for Faction Wide, Reach for Faction Wide, and also for Movement. So there's quite a few good things on his tree. Opportunism is actually very strong. Fire arrow for him, post-battle loot income increase, extra armor piercing damage for both melee and range. So there's a lot of cool things on his skill tree in terms of boosting. Uh, everything seems pretty useful actually. Uh, traits, pretty average. And uh, as a character, I think mainly stands out as a capable warrior. And if we look at his... Um, other officers and also his historical positioning. We mentioned that he's kind of away from the Imperial line in terms of distance, so he never really aspired too much because he knew he would never gain the support. So he never really made a move for Regency, but he was a very strong player in terms of military campaigns. Obviously, uh, Sima Yue had to rely on a lot of intrigue to kill him at the end because he could have defended out west for quite a long time, which is makes sense for his title. And his most capable officer is none other than Zhang Feng. So Zhang Feng is the uncompromising warrior, which is actually quite a fitting title uh, after I tell a story. Uh, a lot of resolve, a lot of instinct, uh, post-battle loot, minus 10% recruitment for cavalry units, upkeep discount for cavalry units. I wonder if that's own army or is that own faction? Own army. See, it doesn't say, but it's sometime own army, sometime personal, sometime faction-wide, but here it confirms it's just for his army. Would be pretty amazing if it's just for the faction as a whole. Uh, plus 10 charge speed for shock and melee cavalry, and plus 3 morale when attacking. Now the rest is pretty generic, cruel, very fitting. And he also has a dragon scale, which is an 80 armor base uh, armor that gives his own retinue terror. Pretty sweet. Uh, the second 80 armor we saw, the other one uh, being a little bit stronger given that the other one had the fatigue resistance going on. Now, historically speaking, he was the vanguard for Sima Yu, and he led a 70,000 force to attack Sima Ai, and he would be the one to eventually capture Sima Ai and burn him to death. A very cruel death, and that siege was very difficult. Sima Ai was holding on very long until the imperial court betrayed Sima Ai and tied him up and brought him to Zhang Feng. Uh, Sima Ai could probably hold the capital longer. Sima Ai was somehow a military genius too. And Zhang Feng during that siege, which happened during the winter, ran out of food himself. Because sieging a capital is very difficult. And he had a lot of slave labor with him. So he turned to cannibalism as they killed off their slave labor and ate them during the winter to make it past the winter so they can win the siege. Very cruel guy. 
And his death is also a bit unfortunate. He got framed uh, by Sima Yue, who sent these uh, envoys to kind of trick Sima Yong that Zhang Fang could betray him. So Sima Yong had Zhang Fang killed, uh, leaving him without one of his best generals. So Zhang Fang's story ended there. Now, the other general who is semi-unique here is Li Han, who we mentioned earlier when we talked about Sima Jiong being turned uh, against Sima Lun and Sima Ai. And Li Han was an imperial uh, court official who was not this keeper of secret. He was kind of the inventor of secret. He wrote forged letters uh, that kind of pitted these brothers against each other. He was kind of working uh, for Sima Yong to spark a conflict so that Sima Yong, who's out west, have a chance to move his army in to help one of the sides. And they initially thought that Sima Jiong would wipe out Sima Ai and they can, you know, raise an army to revenge or avenge Sima Ai. But it turned out Sima Ai was pretty strong in defending himself and wiped out the much stronger Sima Jiong. So they had to change their plans and they worked with Sima Ying to now wipe out Sima Ai. Uh, but he got killed while in the capital. And when he got killed, uh, his death was used as an excuse by Sima Yong. And if we look at his bonuses, some of these will not make sense historically since he didn't evade capture, but they're nice from a gameplay perspective, and you also get 20% character salary decrease, which is very useful. Uh, 2 morale, 3 morale when defending for own retinues, and some undercover network costs uh, for discount for his own spies. So those are interesting. Uh, silver armor, nothing too crazy going on here. Elusive, once again, makes no sense. Uh, perceptive, there's no patience on the tree, so there's nothing synergetic there. And it's a generic commander tree, which is pretty good uh, for a visor position, potentially. The character salary alone worth making him a visor. So that's going to do it for Sima Yu's faction, as we'll turn to the final prince and the final victor of this conflict, Sima Yue. Alrighty, and we're on to our final prince and the ultimate winner of the eight princes conflict, Sima Yue, who is the imperial overseer. Now, he pretty much won because he joined in quite late and got quite a lot of help from his brothers. Uh, he had two brothers that were very instrumental in his rise. And as the Imperial Overseer, he gets 120 points of stats, split evenly among expertise, cunning, and then 20 points of authority. He also has 25% chance to capture enemy generals post-battle, but because he is an Eight Princes Sentinel, he doesn't have patience on his tree. So that only makes up for that. He gets 15 points of melee evasion for melee infantry and then 10 points of diplomatic attitude with most factions. Um, his two brothers are factions in the game, so I think that kind of makes sense. He is, um, you know, pretty decent in terms of spy focus. Uh, that's kind of a faction mechanic of his, which is why you see some of these traits. Aside from that, obviously the key highlight here is the Ancient Silver Sword, uh, Sun Jian's starting weapon, which now goes to him. A lot of authority, a lot of satisfaction, and most importantly, unbreakable with high damage, so very good weapon. Armor, 25 points of stat, split pretty reasonably, and 50 base, it's a pretty average amount. And in terms of skills, Flame of the Phoenix, very good damage ability, Admin Resolve, so-so, and Nature's Ally, which is actually pretty good in my opinion can become unbreakable from meditation, so that weapon can be passed on to maybe your heir or a visor. Um, there is a lot of um, sentinel buffs which are not very useful for a faction leader. The only thing that's kind of passed on is one extra recruit, um, some extra experience, and then some uh, faction support. So overall, not that strong of a leader, um, but you have decent amount of authority so that make up for it. And for him, um, his story is kind of complicated to tell because he definitely uh, joined in very late in the conflict. He didn't have to fight the likes of Sima Dao, Sima Wei. Uh, he didn't even have to fight Sima uh, Lun, Sima Jiong, Sima Ai. He just had to clear the board with Sima Ying and Sima Yong basically at the end. And he is also very distant in terms of his uh, lineage to the imperial line. He is Sima Kui's grandson. Uh, Sima Kui would be Sima Yi's fourth brother, so even farther on the branch compared to even the likes of Sima Yong, which is why even though he won at the end, he can only become an imperial overseer and not the emperor himself because he didn't really have a good claim to the throne. It is rumored that he did end up poisoning uh, the emperor, uh, the mentally challenged one, but there's no proof of that. We can only kind of use um, circumstantial evidence to suggest that he can be the only one who performed such an act. And even if he did that, he didn't become emperor himself, it just went to his heir. And 
his unique or semi-unique generals are a little bit boring because I think historically speaking the most significant characters would be his two brothers uh, including Sima Mo, who has his own faction. We can maybe take a peek at them uh, from the character screen later but He Lun, loyal officer and that's pretty much it. He was an officer. There was nothing nothing like fancy about him. His 20% campaign movement here I believe is personal here. Let's take a look to see if that's correct. Oh my god, it's faction-wide. Okay, he becomes god tier instantly. So he will give 20% faction-wide campaign movement regardless whether he has a position in your court or not. There is no conditional statement of if he is a visor, heir, or faction leader. That makes him incredibly useful. 10% uh, revenue upkeep is bad, but that means we don't ever have to make him uh, a visor or heir to get the 20% movement, which is the good part, and then we can ignore the bad part about 10% revenue upkeep. So that's kind of interesting. He has a silver armor, uh, nothing special here. Patient, loyal, resourceful, those are you know useful traits, but nothing spectacular. Uh, standard commander tree here. Uh, as I said, he was just a lieutenant. There's nothing too fancy about him. Uh, he stuck it around to the end, which I guess is the only key calling card. Uh, he survived beyond uh, Sima Yue. Sima Yue actually died of uh, stress, uh, sickness, and depression. Uh, it wasn't a good life for him as Imperial Overseer. There were other rebellions that happened. There were a lot of nomadic invasions from the north, and he pretty much witnessed the empire falling apart. And when news of other princes rebelling hit him, uh, it kind of uh, made his sickness worse, and he ended up dying from it. So not a fun life after winning the conflict of eight princes. And after he died, uh, his officers tried to take his family and clan. He had a son, uh, many sons, actually. Actually, I think his clan was about maybe 30, 40 people. And uh, they tried to make a run for it from the capital. They had about 40,000 men. There was a famine going on in the capital at the time. And along the party was He Lun and Princess Pei, who is Sima Yue's wife. Uh, princess here doesn't mean daughter. Uh, basically, he's the prince of Donghai, I believe. So she is the princess of Donghai, the wife. Pei is a huge clan. And her clan is actually quite powerful. Um, she is the insightful survivalist. This has nothing to do with eight princes, but this is accurate to history. So on that escape trip, they get wiped out by the Normads. She gets captured as a slave and sold off as a slave. And a Lady Wu, uh, I don't know exactly which Lady Wu this is, is nothing related to Three Kingdoms, but eventually buys her. She actually got a chance to go to Han control population in the south, and once she got there, at that time, she was able to aid some of the remnants of the Sima clan to reform the eastern Jin dynasty in the south. Basically, the north was taken by the Normads. And after she helped uh, the emperor, the new emperor there, she requested to hold a burial for Sima Yue. And it was denied, uh, but she did it anyways. And then his grave got dug up, and then she took the body and went to another place and buried him. Uh, quite a tragic ending there, but insightful survivalists would make sense here. 30% chance to evade capture, 5 satisfaction, 15% income from peasantry. Um, all decent bonuses. She definitely should be heir. Uh, the fact that Helung can give that 20% without being heir, it's very good. Wise and friendly. Uh, these are good traits. More satisfaction and also local satisfaction for wherever she is. Uh, those are all good things. So that's going to do it for our character overview for all the eight princes and their uh, court semi-unique characters. We're going to go back to the tier list and rank them all. Alrighty, so we got to take a good look at all these eight princes and now we're going to rank them uh, into our tier list here. Now there's five slots for eight generals, so they're going to be pretty concentrated. And to be honest, all their stats are super inflated and they're all super strong. Some are just not really beneficial to be leaders. Some are a little bit too old and some we're going to dock points for their historical bad behavior. So starting off with D tier, we're going to go with Sima Lun, the Usurper Prince. So on paper, he has the most stats in the game, right? A ton of stats, but those are just stat points and extra stat points give you marginal returns on the bonuses they create. So honestly, you would prefer to actually get bonuses like you know extra campaign movement or just straight up ammo for all your units rather than just getting more cunning or more satisfaction from authority. So that makes him actually quite weak. And if we look at his 
tree, in terms of skill tree, they don't actually have a lot of leadership skills. There are some decent combat abilities, and he does have the only unique active skill, surprise attack. But aside from that, the fact that he is a leader and he doesn't have a lot of good leadership skills actually drops him quite a bit. And as I mentioned, historical uh, take here as the usurper prince, the only one to actually force the emperor to abdicate. I'm going to dock him a couple points and someone has to be D. So we're going to put him here at D. Then moving on to C, we're going to go with Sima Jun. So this is actually quite similar. As a commander class, you would think he is strong for leadership positions, but his skill tree is actually not really geared that way. And combined with his lack of faction-wide bonuses on his background, the only strong point he has is his pretty combat focus, and he has the yellow turban opportunisticism, uh, or opt opportunism, I think it's opportunism, uh, which give additional post-battle loot and some extra damage for armor piercing. So those things are the strong points, but as a commander class, it's kind of strange. The two commander class eight princes are actually not well designed to be good leaders just because the skill tree is very different from a generic commander. Then moving on to the B tier, we have Sima Ai, who honestly is not that strong as a leader either because he really suffers from low authority. He has a lot of resolve, which is good, and he specializes in range unit with his 25% ammunition. To be honest, he could really be placed into C tier with just that bonus, but I'm gonna give him some extra points for having a lot of yellow turban skills, thus faction-wide bonus, and for the fact that I think he's probably the only good prince out of this group who actually cared for the empire and the emperor, uh, who is his older brother. Then moving on, alongside him in the B tier, we have Sima Liang, who I think is actually quite strong, not only as a general, but also as a faction. He has a lot of really strong dueling skills. He has a decent amount of authority. He also has decent amount of skills for faction-wide bonuses. Unfortunately, he starts out the game at 62. So every single turn, he could just die on you. So that's a big weakness. So I think he's going to drop down a bit and be B tier for us. Then joining aside them, we have Smayu, who as a character is the weakest one of all the eight princes with only 45 points. And that's a huge difference. Like the gap between him and Sima Lin, just from background, is 90 points of stat and armor, another 30 points. So there's 120 points of stat difference between Sima Lin and Sima Yin. Now, obviously points alone doesn't mean much or else Sima Lin wouldn't be D tier, but everyone else have at least 100 and somehow he only has 45. So that part is not great. He has a lot of strong faction-wide boosts in terms of satisfaction, but that's really all he has going for him. He also has good ammunition on his armor, which means he's going to be fine with the bow, but he doesn't start out with a good bow. He's very young, but the low overall stats and poor leadership skills, which is lacking on his tree, uh, which is very combat focused for strategists, a lot of the damage abilities from the Sentinel and strategist skill tree on him, and his active abilities are the weakest of all the groups with Temporary Deflection, Wisdom the River, and Earth and Rampart, uh, which have basically no combat capabilities. And while Wisdom River is really good debuff, you can get that on any generic strategist, and he is a strategist, which makes him not so special in that regard. And then moving on, for the A tier, we have Sima Yue. And the only thing really carrying him is the Ancient Silver Sword, which I think is a lot better than the Celestial Sword, which he carries. They both function quite similarly as good um, satisfaction and authority sword, goes very well on your air. The Ancient Silver Sword does way more damage and also contains Unbreakable, which is something the Celestial Sword cannot match. Even though you can get a set bonus from the Celestial Sword, the set bonus only gives you about four extra morale, which is rather lacking. And on top of that, Sima Yue has um, extra capture rate on him, which I understand uh, is making up for the fact that he doesn't have patience, but a lot of these other generals don't have patience either. So Sima Yue is going to make it into the A tier here. He also has some nice background bonuses. Then the last two generals here are both going to sit in S tier, the vanguards. And it's not because they're vanguards, it's more like their faction-wide bonus is just incredible. So starting with Sima Yue, we have someone who has first 
great active skills. Roar of the Beast, Tenacity of Steel, Binding Fury. You have damage, you have morale hit, you have dueling capability. You have very powerful army-wide backgrounds in terms of movement, replenishment, and that's basically all you want to see. And you also have the Yellow Turban ability of Opportunism to boost your income from combat, to boost extra damage from combat. You also start out with the best weapon, with the Eater of Courage, and he also have great faction-wide bonuses because apparently the Vanguard skill tree for these eight princes contains the most faction-wide useful skills. So it's kind of strange, but these generals actually will do better as leaders compared to say the traditional powerhouse of commanders and his real weakness here is he lack a bit of authority uh, but it makes up for the fact that he's such a powerhouse for military Sima Wei on the other hand has actually really no weakness honestly he has probably the greatest set of leadership bonuses he has a very decent skill tree as we mentioned he even have high authority he doesn't have roar of the beast in place of Aurora Beast, he has Flame of the Phoenix, which is another damaging ability to go with Binding Fury. And he also doesn't have Tenacity of Steel, but he does have Nature's Ally. So he boosts his army a bit more than Sima Yun, who's more combat focused on himself. And that's probably a reflection on the fact that Sima Wei also didn't get a gold weapon either. So there are weakness there, but overall I think the two Vanguard classes are the strongest in the game here. And these two characters definitely deserve to be on top, with Sima Yun definitely taking the first spot. And that's why he's also recommended as a starting faction for the eight princes uh, when you open up the game for that chapter pack and his faction is also really strong but that's another story so that's going to wrap it up for our tier list here hopefully you guys enjoyed this we'll come back next week with a similar format as we'll take a look at all the yellow turban characters in the game and there are a ton of them that are slightly semi-unique with very interesting background so can't wait to get to that hopefully you guys enjoy this one and see you guys then bye